Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to come boldly before you. We think about the cost that it cost your son Jesus for us to have relationship, Father. And Lord, we just, our hearts cry out in appreciation. Thank you for everything that you've done. Father, I'm going to ask you to bless this service. Lord, I'm going to ask you to bind up anything that comes between us and your word today, Lord, any distraction, any, any bad news, any problem or burden in our life, any scheme that the enemy has to keep us from what you have for us today, Father, I just bind that up in the name of Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one that has all the authority and power over everything in the darkness. Father, you said, let there be light, and there was, and I'm praying for that here today, not only in our hearts, but in our minds and in our spirits. Father, I ask you to anoint every word of any teacher in here has to tell the children. I ask you to just take complete control of this sermon, of this time. And Lord, I just love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, kids. Hold on, don't leave. I got to be quick because they're out of here. It's like if someone says, Lunchtime for me, we're gone, right? You don't get a second chance. A few announcements. What's going on here in Engage Church next month? See, I always get this. Here, I'm just going to offend somebody right off the bat. I always get, I don't know what's going on. I, I would have been here, but I didn't know. You know, sometimes as a preacher, I just want to call out, you know, whatever. I just want to say whatever. Listen, if you want information on what's going on, if you want to be a part of it, there's a way. We, ha we have a calendar over there in the back room that has everything that we're going to do for the next month. All right, we got this month, and then we got next month, so, so you have the info there. And I'm even going to tell you some big things that we got coming up next month, a couple weeks in advance, all right? First Wednesday of every month is where things happen. That is prayer night, okay? You think things happen on Sunday? They don't. They're all happening on that Wednesday night. Hopefully, we're praying more for the church and our community and our workplaces and all that stuff on a daily basis, but Wednesday nights when we come in together for corporate prayer. The scripture says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And we believe that here in Engaged Church. It is an important day, night, for us to come together and say we're in unity, devil, and you ain't going to win anymore. Amen? First Wednesday. I, I really want to see, especially if you're teaching our kids, or you're on the praise team, or you're any part of any ministry, and you believe in what's going on here, you need to be here. Security team, whatever it is, be here for corporate prayer. And everybody else is welcome to join any of that stuff. You need to be here. All right? You with me? When is that? First Wednesday of every month. You can't miss it. Third Wednesday. Second Wednesday will be a work night where we're going to work here. We're going to start doing things out in the community. We're checking with the schools. We're checking with the city. We just want to help. We might buy some paint. We might paint a weight room. We might paint a locker room. We may paint a restroom down at the park. We don't care. We just want to serve and give back to our community. Anybody with me on that? We are named Engage Church. It's time we engage outside the walls. Amen? That was a whole thought process in the name. Which brings us to the third week of the month. It's going to start turning into Engage Night. Who likes to eat? I like to eat. We're going to come in here. Nothing's going to be prepared. We're not going to have a lesson. We're not going to do anything. We're going to eat, and we're going to talk about what we're going to do here at Engage Church. All right? What has God laid on your heart? Now, now don't come to me like Chantel. Don't come to me and say, I have this ministry on my heart, and I want you to do it, Brent, because I'm going to say no. I've got a ministry, but how can we help you do the ministry that's on your heart? What are we going to do to engage lost and dying world with the love of Jesus Christ, right? It's a time to come together, to dream, to visualize what we want to be. Hey, this isn't my church. This is our church. What are we going to be in five years, right? I got all these pictures. I'm just waiting for God to plug in the pieces. Yep, that's, I knew you was coming. I knew you was coming. So Wednesday night, we're going to sit down. We're going to eat together. Look at the Bible. Jesus did this all the time. When they say you broke bread, they were eating together in community and dreaming about the future. Amen? When is that? Third, if three people show up and bring food, I'm going to be happy because I'm eating and we're dreaming, okay? I want to see a lot of people there, though. See, you add food, you'll get more people, so. 
You've got to bribe people for now, but then I'm going to hold you. Never mind. Uh, for those who don't know, Shannon and Carrie, you want to come down front? This thing's really bothering me today. This weekend is Volunteer Appreciation Weekend, or is it month, or I don't know what it is. Day, it's a day, and I want you, I don't care if how you volunteer and engage church, if you've built stuff, if you clean stuff, if you've moved stuff, if you're a teacher, your security, if you've done and served any, any capacity and engaged church, if you're a greeter, I want you to stand up real quick, because we want to acknowledge you. Not everybody at once. Keep standing. Keep standing. Hey, I'm going to tell you right now, this is what makes the church run. Okay? This is what makes the church run. If you're not standing now, next year, you need to be standing. That means you're serving. That means you're volunteering. All right? Give Trent one. He won't stand up, but he's the one to put together all the medical and security. He has done stuff. I will call you out. Also, a chance to get in God's Word, all right? Sometimes it's better if we do this in community, amen? If we just get together and we talk about Scripture, we talk about God's Word, it, it, it seems to pull you in and, and you have people there that you can bounce things off of. Uh, Bob is holding a Bible study every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock over at Olive Grill. Again, you got food and you got Jesus. It's a great time. So you guys should check that out. We need to do that together. We need to get involved. 9 o'clock at Olive Grill across the street, Saturday mornings. A lot of things happening. All right, kids, you can get out of here. a lot of kids here today. That's good. Amen. Amen. A lot of what? A lot of new people here. A lot of new family here. How's that? Okay, so let's get started. I got a question. I want to start right out of the gate. I got a question for you. You got to hear this if, if you want to get, get this. Let's say that it's a hot summer day, right? Let's just say that because we know it's 30 degrees because this is Missouri. Hot summer day may be this afternoon. We don't know yet. It could snow. I don't know. But let's say it's a hot summer day and I, you're outside and you're working or you're, you're doing something, you're playing a sport, you, whatever you're doing. You've worked up a sweat. You're hot. It's towards the end of the day. You've been out there for hours. The sun just blaring down on you. feels like the desert and you're thirsty. You're parched, Right? And you come up to me, has anybody been there? You know what that feels like to be thirsty? You know, it's one of those thirsty kids goes, oh, I'm dying, I need something. You're not dying, you're fine, right? You know, back when I was in school in football practice, you know, we were just on the verge of like people need to hydrate, right? Before, before I got in high school, the whole thought process is you was weak if you needed a drink until people started passing out. And then it's like, oh, well, maybe they do need a drink, right? But you're thirsty, you're wore out, and, and you come to me and say, hey, I need a drink. Do you have any water? And I say, wait right here. And I walk off, and I come back with two big glasses of water, right? And I say, I got your drink. You know, I have that smile on my face. If you don't know me, you know something's up because I offer two. I say, which one do you want? And I just look at you and smile. What would be your first question? Huh? Maybe I might do that. Well, what's your question? What'd you do to it? Right. How are they different? Where did you get those? Right? And I'm just like, choose. No. What's the difference? Because you know me. And I've been, probably do this to somebody. It'd be funny. And I said, there is, uh, there is a difference, but you got to make a choice. If that was me and that was one of you, because I know you too, I know you guys, like you know me, I'd say, like, where did you get them, right? So I'd be like, okay, well, this one is, what, what is that, Fiji water? This one comes from volcanic rocks in Fiji paradise, right? And 
One of them came from the toilet. Right? Which do you choose? You knew it. Which do you choose? Right? And if you drink Fiji water, you're yuppie anyway, so that's funny. (laughs) But if you're thirsty, you'll almost drink anything. Today, I want to preach from the context or from the thought process. Thought process. Consider your source. Right? Because I don't think any of us in our right mind would say, I'll choose the toilet water, thank you, over the Fiji water, right? It matters where it comes from, amen? It matters where you draw, what source you draw from. How many of you guys, and it's probably all of us, have ever been hurt by what people say and do? Is that an experience we can all agree with, right? Someone told us, ah, we're not good enough, or someone killed our dream, or someone just called us worthless, or whatever. Because people will be people, right? Amen? That's one thing. It's always going to be consistent, the inconsistency of people in their mouth, in their hearts, in their tongue. Amen? There was a time that in my life that I cared way too much about what people said. I know that sounds mean, but I guess for a Sunday morning, I don't care what you say. That's not what I'm saying. I put too much stock on what comes out of people's mouth. Everybody ever do this? Where the words of someone just crush you and you allow it to happen? Me? I'm the only one? By nature, I'm going to just tell you, and it's a good thing, but it can be a bad thing. By nature, I'm a people pleaser. I don't know if it's coming up through sports where performance equals good boy. You know what I mean? Kind of like you're training a dog. Oh, you did really good there. You did right. Here's your treat. Right? Performance based, you want to make people happy, you got to make coach happy, you got to make people happy. People are looking at you and you can't let them down, right? Sometimes up here I feel like I have to preach a certain, it never happens. I always preach what God gives me. And sometimes some of these messages aren't people pleasing messages, it's God pleasing, right? I don't like people to be upset, I don't like people to have their feelings hurt, right? I want everybody to be happy. I want to be able everybody to agree. Oh, I 100% agree with what we're doing. We're going forward. Now, that may be words you might hear, but behind the back and behind in the closet, you'll have that one person. Oh, man, I don't think we're doing, I don't think that's right, right? I just want things to be peaceful. I want rainbows and cupcakes. I guess that's my idea of happiness, rainbows and cupcakes. (laughs) Are you guys awake? Let me tell you something. As you know, some of you, you can't make everybody happy. Amen? And when they're not happy, what do people do? They start talking. They start talking. And sometimes that talk begins to weigh in my spirit. Anybody with me? Because, come on, if you're talking to somebody, first of all, there's nothing going on. I'm not, this isn't happening. I'm not going to quit here in the next five minutes. <laughs> but that weight of that talk and that critical spirit begins to weigh on your heart. And it's not just me, because you guys have grown up through in this world. You've had friends. You've had parents. You've had people that you thought were there forever. And they, they start, I've done it. I'd be like, oh, I don't know, Tyler. You know, you know Tyler, he's just, you know. It's crazy, right? It's what people do. Now, I may act like it doesn't bother me because I'm tough. I'm a man. I don't care what you say. You're not going to hurt me. Sticks and stones. Hey, don't throw any sticks and stones. I don't want my bone. I don't want to be hit by them either. But sometimes it really does affect me. It really does. It, it at least makes me pause and think in my head, is this the right thing to do? Right? Is this right? Sometimes it's my fault. Sometimes, if you know me, I will do something or say something I probably shouldn't say at that time. Sometimes I'll just do something or say something that's stupid. I mean, I'm just human. I do that. I talk before thinking, right? I, I suffer from that foot and mouth disease. But, you know, sometimes, you know, it's just their hearts. Amen? You know those people that are just going to find something wrong with everything? Those are the people <laughs> that Jesus says, you've got to love them. You don't, don't like them, you've got to love them, though, right? You have to love them. Because sometimes we can do 
nothing, and people just aren't happy. Sometimes we've got to deal with people that complain about everything. Or is it just me? No matter what you do, it's going to be complaint or one of these church complaints. You know what I would do if that was me. Well, do it then. Do it. If it's not the right way, do it. I would love your help, right? You know, if it was me, you know, just over and over. And you know what? If that is your source of life, it will bring you down. Amen? Misery loves company. People with a miserable heart for different reasons, and I'm not blaming the people, I'm not attacking people, there's something in there. Some experience, some, some life lesson that they learned that has brought them down. The best thing they can hope for is to reach up and bring you down when we're supposed to draw from a different source and reach down and bring them up. But when we're choosing the water without asking questions, sometimes we choose the wrong glass and allow the negative to influence us instead of having the positive, which is Jesus Christ in our hearts, to influence us them amen and sometimes you know on the other hand this there's this is a double-sided coin sometimes uh, you can fall victim to the other side of the coin an over encourager I thought encouragement was good encouragement is good an encourager is good an over encourager can be bad let me explain this to you <laughs> my daughter one day, we're just sitting in the car recently. You may have seen this on Facebook. She said, Dad, I want you to be president. And I'm like, no, thank you. You know? Dad, you can do it. I'm like, um, no, I'm 42. I, I appreciate the encouragement and you seeing something in me that I don't think she's seven. But I'm not going to be president. Right? I said, why do you want me to be in president? And she goes, because I want to live with room service 24 hours a day. And I was like, there it is. You didn't really believe in me. You just wanted room service, you know. But, you know, sometimes people come into our life and they say, you're just perfect the way you are. You're just perfect. I had kids on my football team. They'd come up to me and they said, my mommy said I can be quarterback today. And I was like, really? You can't throw a football from here to the altars. We didn't have altars on the field, but I'm just saying that. I said, how can you be quarterback? Your ability doesn't fit the criteria needed for the position. Well, my mom says I can, and that you're just a mean coach. I was like, well, tell your mom Jesus loves her, right? <laughs> right? What do I say? This kid's arguing with me. But somewhere this kid got over-encouraged. Somewhere his mom didn't see some, some, I'm not killing dreams here, but come on. I'm never going to be in the NBA because I'm barely six foot tall and these guys are seven foot tall and I'm 42. It ain't going to happen. I'm not going to be president. I'm not going to do these things. An over-encourager will push people into positions of failures because they, they, it's not, their position. That's why as a pastor you say, what do you want me to do? I will not push you into a position that I think that you're called for. I won't do that because sometimes God has a different plan. Sometimes God's gifts that he's given you lines up in another direction and if I'm not in tune with God, God's not going to tell me what he wants you to do before he lets you know where you're supposed to walk. Amen? But sometimes an over-encourager can push you. Dads, sometimes if you was a good sports athlete, your son might not be where you were. And, the most, and what you can do to damage them is to push them into something that's not their passion. You just got quiet. All the dads just got mad. What are you saying? I'm not saying nothing. Right? What about this one? Kid gets an F on the test. Teachers, you know what I'm talking about. Right? Oh, little Johnny, that teacher's just mean and they don't like you. You don't have to listen to your teacher. What in the world are you teaching your children? That authority doesn't matter. You don't have to agree with authority. You don't have to agree with those that are sitting in positions above you. But you know what you got to do? You got to, if it doesn't interfere with the word of God, you got to follow it. Amen? Someone doesn't agree with that? Maybe? I don't, I don't know. Oh, you're just perfect. 
Don't let anybody tell you you're different. It's not your fault. Blame this. Blame that. Blame him. Blame her. Maybe. It's dangerous. You have to be careful, so careful what you allow in your spirit. Amen? You are responsible. You are the gatekeeper to your heart, the gatekeeper to your mind, and you've got to be very careful when it comes to allowing things in, whether it's over-encouragement or whether it's the other side of the coin. The ones that always complain, the others always bitter, the ones that are always trying to pull you down to where they're at. Now, I don't have anything today that's going to stop that noise. I think that's part of our walk to get that gift of discernment from the Holy Spirit to know what is mine and what is garbage, what I take and what I leave. That's our responsibility to find that place, what to take in and what not to take in. But it's your responsibility on what you allow in. Right? So I, can t- I, I titled the sermon, the, the series, is Consider Your Source, just like the water. We should walk every day asking ourselves, where is this coming from? And a lot of times our self will answer, I don't know, so what's the first thing we should do? Take it to him. Right? It may seem like a good thing when it leaves their mouth. But if it doesn't line up with where you're supposed to be, it can be a dangerous thing. Amen? It may sound like the truth, but there's a truth that's greater than all the truth that comes from this world. It may be true, you may be sick, but there's a greater truth than that by his stripes you are healed. You see what I'm saying? The doctor could give you truth, but the truth of Jesus Christ trumps anything that this world has to offer. Right? That's an amen moment. All right, I'm going to have you start flashing things, so say amen right now. You guys got to help me. It's hard to preach up here by yourself a lot of times, you know it? If you don't believe me, next Sunday someone get up here and I'm going to sit in the front row like this. Right? Every now and then I'll catch someone's facial expression, they'll go, I'll be like, uh oh, was that wrong? Right? (laughs) Consider your source. God, it came from you and you're a sinner. No. (laughs) Right? I've lost everybody. I've noticed you guys will laugh, but you're scared to say death to say amen, right? I'm going to preach in a church one time where I'm going to say something and say everybody's going to get excited, and I won't know what to do. I'll probably just get scared and sit down. What was that? That was response, Pastor. Oh, I kind of like that. Back to the sermon. <laughs> I think we get caught up way too much in the environment we live in. I think it becomes our source of life. You guys seen those, I don't know, those not of the world, not of this world clothing stuff? You see the stickers people put on their car, not of this world. As Christians, we pride ourselves of not being of this world. At least that's what we say. We're not of this world. I'm not of this world. I'm just in this world. All right. All right. So why do you allow this world to have so much influence over our lives? Right? Why do we allow this world to dictate how we should feel? What we should say? Right? Come on, Christian. We can't say anything without offending someone this day. A Muslim can say what they want. They can do what they want. I mean, we'll even make provisions so they can do that. A Christian says something, and we're intolerant. Yeah. You know what? Someone says, you're intolerant. I said, yes, I am, because my God is not of people, but of sin. Do you sin? I sin. But i got to be intolerant of that sin. i got to stop and I say, I say, God, I'm sorry. I'm flawed. I'm, he goes, I know, son. That's why I sent my son to die for you. Amen? But a Christian can't stand up or stand for anything. Or, or, or the world will attack it, right? The world will even, the environment we live in will even make us question ourselves. Oh, you don't look right. You don't, hmm. You don't sound right. You don't, you don't. You're just not, right? And if we're not careful, we start taking that stuff in. If we're not careful, we'll watch the news and the things that we believe and wrong. I mean, Revelation will tell us at the end times, right? They will call good evil and evil good. And you can see it if you'll open your eyes and read the word. You can see it unfolding before us. And we, the church accepts it. Because it's popular. 
because we are getting our substance from the world. And we don't even take time to consider the source, right? We allow our environment to bully us like we're kids on a playground. Let that sink in. The world says, give me your lunch money. And you say, who right? I'm not going to take a beating here. Amen? This isn't a personal attack. This is about the church. If you're part of the church, this is about you. <laughs> it's about me. We've got to stop and consider the stores, right? We can't say certain things because we're going to make people mad and they're going to talk about us. They're going to talk about you anyway. Yeah. Right? Give them something to talk about. Was that old country song? Let's give them some, I don't even know if that's going the wrong way in church, but let's give them something to talk about, church. <laughs> right? That song is not appropriate for church. <laughs> the words are, those words are. <laughs> oh, goodness. Spirit, help me today. This is going way off the rails. Our energy is focused on making people and the world happy instead of living a life of obedience. And that's wrong. When are we going to learn that the Christian walk is going to offend people? Look at who we're following. Look at who we're following. Jesus Christ offended so many people, they put him to death. Revolution. Revolution. You know, we wait all this time for Jesus or, or God or the Holy Spirit. Bring revival, bring revival. We need revival. And God's saying, it is there. The Holy Spirit is there. you got everything you need. It is right there. You step into it and live like it. Our heads get lost in this shuffle of everyday life. Man, we put so much emphasis on the world, we forget where we come from, right? We end up getting life from this world, which I compare it to the toilet water, instead of getting life from this spring of eternal life in Jesus Christ. You can read so many scriptures about that. Jesus told the woman from Samaria, I give you life. I give you water that is eternal life. He's saying, I'll give you something that you can draw from that can be your source of energy, that can be your source of power, that can be your source of abundant life. You can choose this water or you can drink that water because when you drink that water, the toilet water, you're going to be thirsty again, right? You're going to go back to that toilet water time and time again. You're going to go back to this world. If this world, if you think this world's going to satisfy you, have at it. But I offer you something better and something different. And we got a choice, right? Consider your source. Where is your spirit getting fed from today? Wherever you draw your substance, you will begin to reflect. You understand that? If you're anchored in this world, your actions, your talk, your thought process will be anchored in this world. You will show that. You can't hide that. You may do good for an hour and a half on Sunday, at church, right? Anybody can put on an act for a while. But the enemy will expose it. God will expose it. Amen? We need to be deliberate, right? It's easy to get caught up in the wrong source. If, if, if you, you don't believe any of this and you don't want to take any of this, that's fine. But it is so easy to get caught up in the wrong source. You don't even have to try. It happens naturally. This flesh craves the world. Amen? I ain't going to sit up here and pretend to be super Christian that this stuff doesn't affect me. It's easy to hate. It's easy. It's easy to complain. It's easy to gripe. It's easy to downcast, put people down. It's easy to do all that. It's natural, and for the biggest part of my life, that's what I did. I just talked in my tongue. The power of life and death is a tongue. In so many years, I spread death and thought it was funny. It's hard to love. Love will cost you something. When you love, you'll have to battle through some stuff. Amen? You have to be deliberate to love 
All you got to do is ignore to draw from the other source. Right? Wrong stuff will seek you out. You ever notice that? You ever notice you would just go on with everyday life and you're just distracted and frustrated and stuff, stuff. Now all the stuff that you try to get away from in your past suddenly just finds you. That old drinking buddy, that old person, yeah, right? marriage ain't going good, and that old person in your life shows back up out of the blue. Oh, accident. No. Wrong will seek you out. Wrong is easy. You can get in the wrong crowd. You can be in the wrong place. You can, you can just be walking, and you're lost. That's why they call it lost, because it leads you to destruction. You can just be walking lost, and wrong will sniff you out, man. And without even thinking about it, you can find yourself in that situation. My hope is in this series that we're going to learn to pause and consider what's feeding us. Right? Tomorrow morning, the first thing I want you to do is pause before you start your day and say, what's going to feed me today? Is it going to be truth or is it going to be this world? Right? What's feeding my actions? What's feeding my frustration? What's feeding my fear? What's feeding my insecurity? Right? Because it's going to show. If you're not deliberate in your walk, if you're not drawing strength from the right source, you're in trouble. But if you do, but if you do get it from the right source, do you understand it will eliminate everything that is holding you back in your walk? Test me on this. If you'll draw from his word and his truth in your life, I don't care what it is, what what obstacle is in your life, it will be eliminated. It will go away. Amen? Some of you are like, I don't know about that. Well, give it a shot. Today I want to know, we're talking about consider your source. I want you to know where you came from. And you truly believe, oh, I came from God, came from mom and dad, and you know, I don't need details. I get that. But where did you come from? Scripture says that God knew you, that he, he, he knit you together in your mom's womb. Do you believe that? Honestly, do you believe? I, th- I really think if we really believed in God's word, if we could get a group of people that really believed in God's word and made it that personal that Jesus died for my sins. Come on. I've seen people celebrate over getting $100 from somebody. They're like, yeah, a winning lottery ticket, a good football team. If we really believed in our heart that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, you couldn't keep people from these altars. You couldn't keep people from coming in here arms raised and worshiped. Am I stepping on toes? Because God told me to heat it up. If we really believe that Jesus is coming back, how could we not fall on our face and repent of our sins? If we really believe that our loved ones were dying and going to hell, how could we not speak up? Do we really believe or really know where we come from? Isaiah 51. You know, I've been on these Israelites, man. You know, they, from the beginning of time, these Israelites are slaves. God saves them. And then they like, yeah, we're all for you, God. We're going to do this. Yeah, we're going to be a holy nation. And then they get lazy. They start drawing their substance from the world, other idols. They're too busy. You know, got work, got to rebuild this, got to this, this, this. For some reason, they fall away from God, and they find themselves in slavery again. Right? You can be a slave to your circumstances. You can be a slave to this environment, to your job, to your addiction, to your anger, to your fear, to your insecurity. That's the same thing. You're just like the Israelite, a chosen child of God. And you find yourself running in this circle of destruction. I love you, Jesus. I'm here. Forgive me. I'm on fire. And two weeks later, you're a slave again. That's what they're doing in Isaiah 51. If you don't learn and grow from your past, you're destined to repeat the cycle until you get out of it. Why do you think the Israelites wandered in the desert for all those years and not just step into the promised land? Because they didn't learn. Amen? What are you talking about? I'm getting there. 
right? Now, the faithful Israelite numbers at this time in Isaiah 51 is starting to dwindle, right? People are falling away from God, right? Tell us why, Pastor. Look around you today. It's the same reason. People were mocking them. People were looking at them funny. People were like, aren't you an Israelite and follow God? Not me, because they knew that there was going to be a cost to remain faithful. People treated them different. It was easier to accept their master, which held them slave, right? It's easier to accept the world, man, than it is to follow Jesus. That's why a word says, wide is the path of destruction, narrow is the way to life, right? It has to be wide for a reason because there's more people traveling that way, Amen. So here we are, the Israelites are going through some stuff, and you'll be able to relate to this. That's why it's in the Bible. You can, if you just take time to read the Bible, you'll find things that relate to your life. That's why it's in there. That's why God has it in there. You ever had a hard season? A hard season? Me? I have. I've had plenty of hard seasons. See, I call it a hard season. It's not a bad season, right? There are no bad seasons. There's just hard seasons. See, even in the hard season, I can find joy that God's growing me, that he's, he's taken me from place to place. He has given me glory to glory, right? There's no bad days. There's hard days. There's hard days that mature you, that, that toughen you up a little bit, right? Amen? This is a hard season. Everything going wrong. More falls apart than comes together. You know, you know the ones I'm talking about where, where everything you do just seems like <laughs> failure, right? Can't get out of your own way. Maybe it's bad news. Maybe it's a doctor's report. Just plain frustration. What do you start doing in those hard days? Where are you drawing your source from? Most of us, like I have, we start to reflect our hard days. We start showing the frustration. We start complaining a little bit. We start being irritable, right? My point is it's easy to feed off that stuff. When you're surrounded by negativity, it's easy to feed off negativity and put off negativity, right? Maybe not. You might be a good Christian going through hard times, but if you're feeding off a of hard times, and even though you're a good Christian, you're going to be a horrible witness for Christ. You're going to say stuff like, Oh, we just got to be real about this. We got to look at this horrible situation realistic. <laughs> realistic will get you trapped in a rut every time. My, my Jesus didn't die for me to be realistic. My Jesus died so, you know, they call it supernatural for a reason. Because, you know, it's easy for the Israelites to walk up against the Red Sea and Moses say, realistically, those guys going to kill us. Right? Real, I'm just being real, guys. I'm sorry I brought you out here. We're getting ready to get killed by the Egyptians. Hold on. Here we go. That's realistic. But that's not God. That's not God. He didn't operate on our realistic. He parted the Red Sea, and they all passed. And as soon as the Egyptians got in there, he closed the Red Sea. He goes, I'll defeat your enemy for you if you'll draw from me for your source of life. Amen? I don't know. Maybe. So the Israelites, they're feeding off the wrong environment. It's easy. Who can blame them, man? They find themselves afraid, alone, isolated, frustration. And they start asking themselves the same questions we ask. Is this all really worth it? Is it all real? Is it, is it, is it worth it? Right? They're beginning to reflect their environment, and they're not hiding it well. And this is what God says to them, and this is what God says to you today. He says it through the prophet Isaiah. He says, listen to me, Isaiah 51, 1 to 3. All who hope for deliverance. Is there anybody that's ready to be delivered from something today? Nobody, we're good. One, two, right? Three, I believe God's going to work on that today, right? It takes a little uh, drawn from the right source to have the courage to raise your hand and believe that God's bigger than what's going on, all right? Amen? Listen to me, all who hope for deliverance, all who seek the Lord. Consider the rock on which you were cut. 
the quarry from which you were mined. Yes, think about Abraham, your ancestor, and Sarah, who gave birth to a nation. Abraham was only one man when I called him, but when I blessed him, he became a great nation. Do you understand the weight of that verse right there? I'll talk about it here in a minute. The Lord will comfort Israel again and have pity on their ruins. Her desert will bloom like, the, like Eden. Her barren wilderness like a garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found here. Songs of thanksgiving will fill the air. So Isaiah got to Isaiah and said, Israel, consider your source. Know where you came from. Do you need an example? Look at Abraham. If you don't know who Abraham and Sarah were, these were old people. They were 90. In their 90s, they were old, and God said, they don't have any kids. And God said, I'm going to make you a nation, Abraham. A nation. Millions. Guess what? We have a nation right now of Israel that's here today. You all heard of it, right? Everybody hates them. End time stuff again. That's where this started. I'm going to make you a nation. And is it easy to look at the circumstances and say, dude, I'm 90. I, I haven't had, Sarah hadn't had kids now, before now. But God looked at the impossible and said, I'm in control of that too. I'm the king of that too. Watch this. And he gave him a child. And from that child gave, came more children and more children. And before you know it, the nation of Israel was born. But now it finds itself captive. And God says, remember what I did with them. And yeah, everybody said impossible. And yeah, everybody said not going to happen, unlikely, probably not. But you know what Abraham did? He was faithful. He said, you're God. Right? You ever think, and this is just the way my brain works, when Sarah got pregnant in her 90s and Abraham was like there, you know, other people come out, other shepherds in the field came out and said, what did you do, Abraham? Wow, 90 years old. What could he say? It was God. It was God, right? Because, come on, if we had a 90-year-old get pregnant right now, wouldn't you be asking the same question? Whoa, big guy, you're awesome, yeah. Stud. He's like, no. That's God. Abraham was faithful. And look what God did with one faithful person. Amen? One faithful person drawing from the right source. I'm getting ready to hit you. What would happen if this group right here had that faith? If a nation was birthed from one guy's faithfulness, what could we do? You ever think of that? No? Okay, is this new? You're going to respond? You're like, I'm out of here. This is crazy. I'm talking crazy today. We can't win the city of Aurora with this if God used one to birth a nation. We can't take back our schools with that. And God can birth a nation? God can do more in a blink of an eye, than we can do our entire lifetimes put together, right? What happened if we had that faith and we drew from the right source and fear didn't stop us anymore? If impossibility didn't even enter our mind, right? If temptation didn't blind us, if we were not on this mission and all of a sudden this looks good, if we could just weather a storm to get to where we're going, what would happen if we stand firm and the world didn't frustrate us and people didn't stop us and what they said didn't matter and what they did to us, who cares? We're pushing through for the glory of God. What happens if this group right here would say today, we're going to worship and not worry? Will we ever know? I'm in. You in? All we got to do is tap into that source. Right? What you got going on today that's bigger than God? What did you have going on last week that was bigger than God? Because there's not an answer to that, and some of us went through some big stuff. Right? What's so scary and horrible that are so good and 
tempting that your God can't handle it, right? Isaiah said, consider the rock on which you came from. Right? Consider where you came from, right? God knit you together in the womb. So, and God said, let us make man in our image. And I ask you, what is so big from your God? And you'll say nothing. And I say, well, where'd you come from, him? So what's so big for you that you can't handle it? Amen? What's so big that you can't get through it? And I know today, if I ask you in church, everybody would be like, there's nothing, Pastor, we're good, and, and, and you'll give me church answers like that. And I love church answers, but sometimes I just like to call them out, really, you believe that? Right? I'm being mean today, I know. That's all right. Because I know on Sunday we can handle that, but what does it say, what's your actions say Monday and the rest of the week? Knowing Jesus as our source, it can give us the hope and encouragement to get through any storm that we face. Getting into his word and studying his word and just being with him. Right? Look what he did with Abraham. Look what he did with Matthew, the tax collector. Look what he did with Peter, the fisherman that was so stubborn and so headstrong and just wanted to... Look what he did with Paul, a murderer. And he said, I can make you new. Amen? What can our God not do? I'll ask you another question. You're on, how's your peace today? I think the devil's number one tool to distract us is worry. It's torment. How's your peace today? If peace was a fuel tank, where would you be at? Right? I'm full on Sunday, but come Monday, I'm running three-quarter Friday. I got buzzers and lights going off, right? This is for all you gearheads. I'm trying to stay relevant, talking about fuel. Right? Because our source is what drives us. Our source, where we draw source and life from, is our fuel. Right? If you had an old truck, guys, girls, we're in Missouri, so girls were mechanics too. If you had an old truck and you got fuel at the same gas station every day for 20 years, and I hear this from the old timers who are like, they got good gas down there at such and such, and I'm like, Okay, <laughs> you know, I'm not a gearhead. I don't know anything about vehicles, but they got really good gas down there. That's where we get our gas. I'm like, okay. And if you drink, get, went and one Sunday you just ran out of gas and you had to stop at another gas station and now your truck doesn't run, right, it's not acting right, how many of you go back to that source? None of us. I might because I don't know any different, but other than that, right? So why do you keep filling your tanks up with stress and worry, with lies and burden, with other people that could care less? Why do you keep drawing from that source that is destroying you time and time again, that addiction that you know is wrong and you want to get for? Why? And I know it's just not the easy cut and dry, but it is in Jesus Christ. You give it to him and get rid of it. Why do you keep drawing from that? You with me? Why do you keep drawing from the world and trying to continue to perform at a high level in the kingdom? It won't work, man. This is one of my favorite passages. And if you have stress, if you have worry, I would suggest you write this down, right, and go to it. Matthew 6, 24 through 34. It's a long one, but it's, it's what a lot of us need today. It says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store foods in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the li lilies in the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glories was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully about wildflowers that they, that they are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. 
Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles are enough for today. Then he's talking about eating and drinking and clothes. He's not talking about, don't worry about Under Armour, Nike, or whatever these designer clothes are. I don't even know designer clothes. That's as far as I get is Under Armour and Nike. He's talking about just something to put on. He's saying, don't worry about that stuff, right? That's pretty big stuff to worry about. That are, that's necessities to life, and God's like, I got you. I got you, right? Food, water, and clothes, and necessity in life. Now, you tell me what our worries are and how they compare to food, water, and clothes, we worry about cable and internet and my son able to hit a curveball and my boss is a jerk and, and consumes us. Not only does it just cross our mind, it consumes us. Sometimes that's the very thing that gets us up in the morning. I got to go to work. I got to do this. I got to do this because I got to pay this and I got to have this and I got to look like this. It consumes us. When we focus on worry, our life gets consumed by worry. And worry takes our toll physically, spiritually. I don't have time for church. I don't have time for Wednesday night prayer. I don't have time to get in my Bible. Why? I got to get this place. I got to do this. I don't have time to spend it with Jesus. I don't have time for this, to spend in community, to worship. We live a life of worry instead of a life of worship. Amen? You guys are quiet today. You won't have peace until you consider your source for peace. Until you make spending time with Jesus a priority, you will never know true peace. Amen, Pastor. Okay, thank you. Right? Just had this conversation today, and this was me. Well, what do I say? I don't, I, what do I do? I mean, what, 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 do, what motivates God to work on my behalf? His love? You don't have to say nothing. You don't have to do anything. He's already done it. Take time and just be still in his presence and see what happens. And if you feel like saying something, just be you. I need something. I need you. Amen? We don't have any special lingo we got to talk to. <laughs> it cracks me up. You know, I'm kind of that way too when I pray. I'll be like, Father God, da -da -da -da, Father God, da -da -da, Father God. And he's just like, quit saying my name and just talk to me. Right? Just, just talk to me. You're my son. I know what you need. I know what's hurt hurting you, you know? In group prayers, I've had this happen before. We say prayer requests, and I, I forget one because I'm an idiot sometimes. And they're like, you didn't even say it. I'm like, God knows. And we were together. God knows. Right? Guys like, quit repeating what everybody says and just say you love me, say you're with me, and repent of your sins, and, and I'm with you. We got this. Amen? Amen? But if you don't consider your source, if you don't spend time there, you won't get it. Relationship's a two-way street, right? Sometimes you talk, sometimes you listen. God doesn't need you to do anything. We're going to close. Anthony, you ready to come out? Anthony? Yeah, I think he's back there. Oh, there you are. Come on, Anthony. He even told me where he's going to be at. He said, just give me a sign, so there you're on. <laughs> if the world is your source, if money is your source, material, your kids being able to perform at a high level, if you have to say yes to everything to prove your worth, um, you're going to stay in the cycle. If people are your source, God forbid I am your source for the Word of God and, and 
you, if, my, if I depend on your relationship with God, you're in trouble because I'm a man and I'm failing the areas of my life. Amen? Any pastor says they're perfect, you ought to automatically start going, there's something wrong with that man because he ain't Jesus. Now all the pastors are going to comment on Facebook. I'm just living it real, man. He's your only source. He said to that woman, he said, you'll never be thirsty again if you drink from this well. Everything else, you're going to be thirsty again. That keeps you in that circle. Got to go back. I got to go back. This toilet water is horrible, but I got to go back. I got to find value. I got to find worth. I got to find approval. I got to find someone who loves me. I got to find this, find that. And he says, you just come once over here, and you'll never leave, and you'll be full. Amen? This is cool. Watch this. Watch this. Uh, Genesis 1.1. And God said, let the land sprout with vegetation. He is speaking everything to assist, into existence. He's standing on the edges of the... Can't talk, need a drink. Standing on the edge of nothing. He says, let there be. Amen, you with me? You can read that in the first three verses. It, it doesn't take long. Let there be light. He was speaking to the light, and there was. Right? 111, God said, let, there, let the land, who's he talking to? The land, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees and grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce kinds of plants and trees from which they came from, and that is what happened. God is speaking in existence, and he cries out to the land. He goes, land, you will be the source for these seeds, Right? You will be the source for trees, for grass, for bushes, for everything. The land will be the source of life for the plants. So we speak into it, land, let there be. And there was. Genesis 1.20, and God said, let the waters, water, I'm talking to you, swarm with fish and every other life. Let the skies, skies, I'm talking to you, be filled with birds of every kind. Water, you're going to have fish in you. You're going to be the life source for these fish. Sky, you're going to be the life source for these birds. Right? What happens when you take a tree and you pull it out of the ground? Its source. What's it do? It dies. What happens when you take a fish from the water? it dies. Or a bird from the sky. You fry it up with chicken and it dies, right? It dies. You with me? Serve them with mashed potatoes and I'm hungry. It's lunchtime. When you take the creation out of its source, it dies. This is cool. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. He's talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the three head, three in one. He's talking to himself. Let us make man in our image. They'll reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. He is talking to himself. He is saying, I will be their source of life. Amen. Pastor, good stuff, yeah. You take a fish out of the water, it will die. You take a tree from the ground, it will die. You take you out from God, and you'll die. It's a perfect design. It's creation from the beginning. Let us make Davy our image. Let us make Carol. Let us make Donna and Kara and Thad. I don't have time to name all your names. Let us make your name in our image. You are cut from this rock. You can't take God out of a man because you're created in that image, but you can take the man away from God if you make the wrong choices. 
So drawing from the right choice, the right source, isn't an option. It's a necessity if you want to have life. Later on in Genesis, the greatest lie of all time was told to Adam and Eve. Well, told to Eve. Adam just sat there and went, okie doke, because he was an idiot, but just letting it happen. Eve's talking to the serpent, right? The serpent said, if you take this fruit, the forbidden fruit, God said you can have all, all these trees in the forest. Can we turn down the lights a little bit? You can have all these trees in here, all this fruit except one tree, right? Today we'd be like, that's unfair. And I'm like, he gave you everything but one. That's more than fair. And the serpent says, you can have all, the serpent goes, Eve, did he really say you couldn't have this? She goes, no, just that one tree. And the serpent replied back with, uh, well, if you, I know the reason why, because if you eat from that tree, you'll be just like God, right? You remember when the serpent said that to Eve? If she'd have known her source, she would look back at him and said, I'm already just like God. One lie. The believing of one lie cost humanity because Eve didn't take the time to consider the source. She believed the world and the enemy. Amen? So this week, man, pause. Pause. Before you react, before you say a word, before you join in, before you get upset, before you want to set the record straight, pause and consider the source. Amen? People are going to say what they're going to say. People are going to do what they're going to do. But a Christian needs to know where they come from and where they're going. That's what makes us different. Amen? These altars are going to be open. All right? If you've been drawn from the wrong source, now's the day to come back to the living water. All right? If you believe the lie, if you've been hurt, if you've been destroyed, if you've been depressed, if you've been all this, man, it's time to get back from drawing life. It's time to get back to God. It's time to give it to Jesus. So I'm going to pray. We're going to take up tithes and offering again, guys. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about money, but we could not do the things that we do without you guys giving, and I am thankful for that. Uh, for, I don't say this to gloat. I don't say this. We didn't even put our name in there. We were able to pay off kindergarten through sixth grade overdue lunch accounts this week or last week in the schools from Engaged Church. We were able to touch 65 families by doing that. Hence, because you guys are faithful givers. Right? We called about the junior high and it was like almost $900. And we we're like, we'll start with the younger kids. <laughs> right? But we want to increase in our giving. We want to increase in what God's doing. We want to let people know that they are valued and that they are loved by Jesus. Amen? And that they belong here. Not here in the church, but here in the kingdom. Jesus died for them too. So I want to thank you for your faithfulness. At, we couldn't do anything without your hearts given like that. So, But today these altars are open. It's time to come home. It's time to come back to Jesus. It's time to start drawing from the right source. And it's time for us to stand together and let's do the things that God's called us to do. It's time to reach community, workplaces. It's time to take the enemy and serve him as eviction notice and get him out of here. Amen. Where the drug dealer has to leave because no one's buying the drugs. Where the alcoholic has to find a new source of life because it doesn't work anymore. Alcohol doesn't work anymore. Where only the love of Jesus Christ rules and reigns and the enemy is evicted. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, again, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. I ask you to keep this word fresh in their hearts, in their minds. And Father, help us apply this to 
everyday life. Father, right now, Holy Spirit, I know that you're working on some people out there. And I just pray in the name of Jesus that nothing stops them from coming down to meet with you today, Father. Now, it, if they're uncomfortable, Father, that won't work. If they're afraid, that won't work. Lord, just give them the strength and the courage to do the things that their heart's crying out for them to do, Father. Lord, let us no longer get our substance from the things that are holding us back, but help us draw near to you. Because that's why you died. That's why you went to the cross. That's why you came. It was for us to know life and that more abundant. Father, I speak to all the captives today that those chains be taken off, that those doors be opened up in the name of Jesus that those mindsets are renewed and that our hearts and our passion and our purpose is flamed up inside each of our hearts where it's a consuming flame that we can't ignore it any longer because we know that we are destined for greatness in your kingdom. Father, no longer allow these things from the enemy to keep us complacent, to keep us divided, that keep us focused in the wrong direction, Father. Father, they are broken by the name of Jesus today. We love you and we give you all the glory. And the church said,